So hello, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever it is that you are. Um, my name is Rupert Till. I'm chair of the International Association for the Study of Popular Music, and it's my, been my pleasure to um, start these monthly research seminars. We're going to have one every month. They will be recorded. They are being recorded, um, and we'll put them on, up on YouTube. And there'll be a different one every month, hosted by a different international branch of ISPIN. So it gives me great pleasure to um, to pass over to the Australian New Zealand branch, who are hosting this month's and Catherine Strong. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming along. Uh, before we start the formal presentations, um, I'm just going to do a couple of quick things. Uh, the first thing is that I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. Um, the people who are presenting today are on various different uh, lands of uh, Indigenous people uh, whose lands have never been ceded, whose sovereignty has never been ceded, whose lands were stolen from them. So I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, where Fabian and myself are located and where we've conducted our research. Uh, I'd like to conduct the, uh, sorry, to acknowledge the Turbal and Jagera uh, peoples whose land uh, Ben Green is located on in Mianjin slash Brisbane, and also the Ugamba people uh, where Andy is located on the Gold Coast. Um, so, yeah, just uh, to, to acknowledge that, that these peoples are, uh, uh, still undergoing uh, extreme uh, dispossession and discrimination within the uh, country of Australia, so-called Australia. Um, I'd also like to just give, give a really quick overview for anybody who isn't located in Australia of what the COVID situation has been here in order to provide the context for the presentations that you're about to see. Uh, so, so basically, Australia uh, has undertaken what, what has ended up being an elimination strategy towards COVID. Um, which means that currently we have only a few uh, community transmissions on any given day and often none at all. Um, but it also means that uh, the, the lockdown in this, in this country has been uh, in some places quite extended. And uh, it also means that <coughs> movement uh, both in and out of the country and also within the country has been extremely restricted during the COVID period. So uh, international travel has been uh, stopped uh, almost immediately once the first cases came into the country um, and hasn't restarted since. Anybody who comes into Australia has to undergo a two-week uh, hotel quarantine. And um, uh, within the country, for I believe the first time since Federation, borders have actually been put in place or uh, meaningfully put in place. Like there's always borders between the states, but but they have turned into hard borders on quite a number of occasions. So just in terms of what that means for the music industry, there has been um, no international touring at all, either in or out. And what is able to happen even within the country has been really quite restricted. So that's just the sort of overall uh, context of here. So let's get into our presentation. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague. Uh, Fabian, who's going to start the first of the presentations, uh, which is on the study that we've done of the Victorian uh, music industry during this time. Um, Victoria in particular has been, has been more locked down than any other state. We had a three month hard lockdown period from July last year. So uh, uh, that has impacted on our state quite a lot. Um, the presentation that Fabian and I are gonna to do today is a really high level findings, like we're just gonna present a bunch of findings from our research. The full report is going to be out soon though. So for people who are interested in the uh, extensive detail that is contained within that 100 page report, um, as well as being able to look in more, in more detail at what we're going to say today, uh, that will be coming very shortly. So over to you, Fabian. All right, thank you very much, Catherine. Let's just get that up there. All right, yeah, so look, our report was um, called Understanding Challenges to the Victorian Music Industry During COVID-19. So we conducted um, survey and interview research uh, really at the height of what came to be known as the second wave of COVID infections in Victoria, um, during which the or something like three month long um, lockdown and stay at home orders were issued. So we sort of approached and you know, spoke to and surveyed uh, you know, musicians and others from the music industry really right at that time when uh, future was perhaps most uncertain for them. 
So we prepared this report um, in part yeah, for the Victorian Music Development Office and also the Office for Women. So this was a mixed methods um, approach that we used. We started off with a survey of 40 open and closed ended questions to measure the COVID impacts on anyone making money from music related activities. So we weren't just looking at um, you know, artists, musicians, DJs, composers and so forth. We were also looking at the, you know, members of the live music sector, business owners, um, staff, lighting and sound technicians and so forth, but then also those working in the recording music industry sector as well, as well as, you know, further support staff, people perhaps working in a position of government that support music. Um, there's even a music journalist in our survey group as well. So um, as I said, the um, survey ran between 25th of June and 25th of August, so right at the peak of that lockdown period. And we ended up with 292 usable surveys. Now, um, from within the survey sample that we got, we also managed to um, do 11 semi-structured interviews just to really probe into um, some of the responses that were coming out of those surveys. These interviews were up to one hour. Um, yeah, with survey respondents, we nominated to be followed up with. So we really had a diversity of participants um, across the survey and interview cohorts. Um, so diverse in terms of their gender identity, um, the age range they nominated, um, ethnic identity, and also which industry sector they align with. Um, and I'll go into the industry sector in a bit more in a moment. So generally, um, our surveys and interviews were there to measure the impact um, that COVID has had on people's income, on their use of time during um, the pandemic and lockdown situation, uh, their attitudes, and also future plans within the Victorian music industry. So just trying to really seek out you know, what possible futures people were imagining during COVID, but then also in a potential post-lockdown or even an ongoing sort of lockdown scenario. So some brief findings. Um, yeah, firstly, um, this is a big one. So um, this is a, a graph showing the percentage of income from music-related activities pre-COVID and then since COVID that our survey participants reported. As you can see there in the red, those making less than 30% of their income from music-related activities has boomed up from about 28% up to 65 there so people are absolutely losing out on um, income from in within the um, the industries and interestingly we also asked participants about any income they might be making from outside of the music industries and indeed the income lost from within music related work was not being replaced by any income from outside of music related work so people are either just losing out money and having to make savings to account for the new financial situation or perhaps um depending on some kind of income supplement, such as the job keeper and job seeker schemes that the federal government ran in Australia. So um, this next set of graphs shows how much income decreased by, um, by music industry sector. So we defined our sectors uh, roughly as something like music talent. So those you know, producing uh, creative works, intellectual property and so forth. Those in the live music business, so running events, um, or uh, venues that you know posted live music and performances, and then also those who are working in recorded music and sort of more promotional management and support roles on the other end. So we really want, wanted to define out those who depend on the live music sector for their income versus those who have perhaps other forms of income which might be more sustainable during the lockdown sort of scenario here. And um, you know, as you can see, those who lost more seventy percent or more of their income representing the red bars were very concentrated in the live music business um, sector, so by far the hardest sort of hit area within the Melbourne music industries. Um, we also asked participants uh, to you know, rate some uh, comments on a Leichhardt scale. So this one here, I've been worried about paying for basics like rent and food. Most people agree that yes, this is sort of at the forefront of their minds, just to sort of emphasise um, the kind of financial impact that loss of income is having for participants. Um, some of these economic impacts are felt quite sharply by some. And what I have here is a quote um, from a road crew person um, who had just sort of, you know, just as 2020 was um, starting, had just moved into a bigger house with their flatmate, had bought a new car. And then, of course, I mean, you know, they've had quite a secure job as a road crewman. Um, and their flatmate indeed worked for the same company as them. And then once the lockdown the pandemic had hit, have had to sort of sell the car, start selling things on eBay, 
They've said that their landlord has actually stopped talking to them entirely. So they're kind of afraid that once the uh, moratorium on evictions ends in Victoria, that landlords essentially going to ask them to read out and evict them at that point. Um, so quite a sharp impact for some people who have, you know, planned financially, not expecting this sort of event um, to come around. Some of the more common experiences that we found in our interviews and surveys um, during lockdown. So most activities, for well, most music-related activities hold to, and that's not just income-generating activities like paid employment or contract work, but also just general music-related activities such as rehearsing in bands or being able to practice stagecraft, like lighting and sound technician work and so forth. So really disengaging with those sort of day-to-day -day music industry activities. Um, respondents were also twice as likely to disagree than agree that they found it easy to motivate themselves during lockdown or that they have been productive. Um, yeah, so motivation, productivity are taking a big hit there. Um, and also it's found themselves doing more unpaid work generally. And so uh, often this unpaid work was facilitated by um, you know, uh, digital media technologies, the same kind of technologies that allow people to stay connected to others, you know, times you know, in the industry, also um, encouraging people to do work for the sake of exposure or, you know, kind of just to stay connected rather than sort of getting an income from that work. Um, participants generally said so they were finding it hard to maintain connections with others in the industry because, um, you know, bars, restaurants, other public venues have been locked down during this period. Um, those regular meetup venues, networking places and so forth um, have been put out of reach for most people. And, you know, in most cases, people were limited um, you know, for quite a time to like a, a sort of small radius around their, you know, direct residences to sort of meet up with or, um, you know, uh, connect with other people for a period. So um, generally, our participants have found this experience to be quite stressful, probably needless to say. Um, just an example here of how, um, I suppose, uh, the um, monetization of music work has been impacted. So we had a quick participant who had organized for um, their debut album release at the start of May 2020. So they'd already put in all that effort, um, all that sort of, you know, um, musical creative work, but also the promotional work around sort of getting their albums set up. And then, of course, when the lockdown hit, they're unable to then go on to monetize that work um, through the album release, followed with live performances, merchandise sales, and so forth. So it's really interrupted the kind of temporal flow of where it is that that labor that was put into music work then becomes monetizable, you know, through those, you know, events you know, specific activities such as going out and playing gigs, promoting work in person, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, quite quite a hard economic hit for some because it's interrupted that sort of flow of monetization. So look, um, I'm going to hand over to Catherine now um, just to go through some further results from that study. And if you'd like to share your screen, Catherine. Yep, so uh, here we go. Thanks very much, Fabian. Uh, is that coming through now? Yep. Um, okay, so we asked, we, we did want to uh, ask people about positive outcomes that might have come through from the lockdown period as well as only focusing on the negative things which to a certain extent was sort of predictable. We asked people about whether they had learned any new skills and of the people who answered that question about 50% had learned new skills. We asked them to tell us a bit about what type of new skills they'd learned and these were the main uh, themes that emerged out of what we were told. So people uh, were learning new business skills, uh, which was partly about uh, trying new things in terms of getting their music out and thinking about taking their careers in different directions as well. Uh, they learned new music creation and production skills, uh, online tech skills, and also a small number, uh, we're talking about personal management and coping skills that they learned during lockdown. Uh, one interesting thing that did come out here was the music creation and production skills that people were learning were generally spoken about as being something that people were really happy to do, that they were actually pleased to have the time to pursue some of these things. They were spoken about as, oh, for ages I've wanted to get better at X or Y, and the lockdown gave me the opportunity to do that. So people were very happy to sort of engage with these things. The online skills were a little bit different. It was something that was seen as a, much more of a necessity, and people had much more negative experiences with these. So some people were finding they were facilitating fantastic new things, but uh, other people were saying uh, they are very limited. I don't think I will use these once we get back to, to sort of the real world. Uh, so a, a more mixed message coming out of those. 
We also uh, asked people uh, whether they think their involvement in music will be different when the crisis had passed. And an uh, overwhelming majority of people said yes to this question. Uh, in terms of what people then said about what that involvement would look like, um, there, there was a quite a large proportion who were just, we don't know, that it is so uncertain at the moment that we can't get our heads around what things are going to be like uh, in a month or in six months or in a year from now. So it was hard, very difficult for people to make plans, which added into that stressful element that Fabian was talking about before. Um, of the people who did give us an answer that, that, that wasn't just I don't know, uh, there was about a third of them had a positive feel to them. So people had uh, started to make solid new plans, they, they had a path that they could see emerging for them. So uh, uh, answers like this, I think COVID has allowed me to evaluate where I am in my career and develop my skills to a point where I am confident to move in a new way. Isolation has allowed me to show myself and my peers what I'm capable of, allowing me to move into bigger roles in the future. So this person uh, has, has come through lockdown feeling quite good about where they are. More often, though, people had, had negative spins to what it was that they were saying. And the answer to this question about whether they had considered leaving the music industry were about two-thirds said that they had thought about it compared to about a third who said no. Uh, gives us an indication that for many people, their idea of what the future is is not very positive. Um, we think there's a real risk here for quite extensive talent loss within the music industries in Australia, uh, in Victoria, sorry, that's where we were looking at. Um, we had people who told us, for instance, as in this quote, that they had already left the industry. So this person who was working in accounts and finance in, in music said that, that their firm had let them go uh, I'm no longer working in the music industry. I now work for a tech firm, any more income. I had to take what I could to pay the rent. I don't think I'll have an opportunity to get back into music-related work for a very long time. And this person had been working in this area for 15 years. There are other ways in which talent loss uh, is at risk of taking place. So uh, some people just want to leave. But for other people, I mean, we know already that the music industry is a place where people have portfolio careers where they will often have multiple roles and often they will balance their music work which is often not paying that well with work outside of the music sector and uh, quite a number of people said that what would have to happen is that they would have to increase the work they do outside of music and decrease the amount of music they do within music so a talent loss uh, a situation there as well so this person says um, they love music, it's all they know, but they have a family to support, so they don't think they can leave all their eggs in the live music basket anymore. Uh, a lot of other people said that they thought they would be working less in music just because they anticipated that, that there would be less work in music across the board. Uh, they saw the sector as shrinking and uh, opportunities not being nearly as, as available as they have been in the past. Um, this was sort of balanced, though, with, uh, predictably, you know, uh, people also having this uh, emotional pull towards music that was making it hard for them to work out uh, what they were going to do. They could see that it was going to be really hard for them to maintain their career, to maintain an income, but at the same time, as this person says, um, I've considered leaving the music industry altogether, but I can't imagine my life without it. I don't know who I am without it. So the, the strong emotional investment that people have uh, is keeping them in and, and thinking about what that's going to mean for people in terms of uh, their, their outcomes economically, uh, in terms of security, is going to be something we're going to need to keep an eye on as, as the situation plays out. We asked people as well what they would like to change when the industries get themselves back up on their feet. Uh, there were four main things that emerged here. Uh, the first was that people overwhelmingly wanted improved working conditions. In music. So there was a lot of talk about uh, artists being underpaid, uh, a lot of talk about very poor conditions, uh, uncertain conditions, the, the amount of precarity and um, uh, uh, insecure work within the industry was spoken about a lot as well. Um, for some respondents, and I think this is quite an indictment of what the situation was like before COVID, some respondents told us that their physical and mental health had improved during lockdown because the pressures of their jobs had been so intense before this time. One respondent told us about getting a knee operation uh, that she had needed to get for years and years and years and just had never had an opportunity to step back from her job for long enough to be able to get that done. So those sorts of stories were um, a bit distressing. Um, people talked about wanting changing change in industry culture. So I'll just go through this really quickly. This person, I think, 
uh, sort of summarised a lot of this in that they spoke about, even though this was a, a sort of extreme example, like wanting to burn the whole thing to the ground, what this person is picking up on when they talk about uh, unequal practices in terms of sexism, racism, uh, those sorts of things, um, talking about uh, people's creativity being used for other people's profit and talking about uh, people not having control over, over their own product and their own uh, careers uh, as being things that they would like to see done differently. And, and these themes, even though not expressed in quite such extreme terms, came out quite a lot in what people were saying. They would like to see fundamental changes in how uh, people approach what happens in the industry. Finally, uh, these last two, support from outside. So people said we need a lot more government support, for instance, more grants or money being put in to support the sector, given that it does do so much for the community and for society and the, the economy. And finally, um, the idea that recognition, there needs to be a better recognition of what people do, the skills that people have, and the amount of work and the amount of uh, man and person power it takes to put on a show, to record something, to be in a band. Uh, there was this idea that the skills that people have in, in the music industries are just not recognised and that also this is part of what makes people unwilling to, to pay, to pay more than 10 bucks for a gig or to pay at all for recorded music. So, so thinking about how the industry can sell itself as a highly skilled area that deserves uh, proper compensation for what people do is another thing so that's it, it for us i mean as i said this was this is just the findings um there there are we we sort of have a, a, a lot of work to do in terms of working out where this fits uh it is sort of not a lot of work we will be producing papers that will have a much more theoretical uh, perspective to them. Um, and as I said earlier, the report itself, uh, which is, is is quite detailed, quite long, will be available very shortly and I'll send a, a link around to the mailing list when that happens. Sorry, we're a little bit over time there, but I will now pass over to our colleagues in Queensland to talk about their study. Thanks, Catherine. I'll just wait for the um, slideshow. Can you see it? Yes, thanks, Anasta. We're currently on the methods slide. The background. Yeah, here we are. Okay, thank you. So, um, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, so, our project is analogous to Kath and Fabian's project. Uh, it's looking at um, an exclusively younger demographic because what we're primarily interested in is the impact of COVID on younger music makers and how it has either positively or negatively or a combination of both impacted their well-being and we'll talk about what we mean by well-being as we go along um, but essentially we were interested in this age demographic because it's an age demographic that's already disadvantaged in many ways not completely but quite a bit in terms of risk and uncertainty and, and precarious living um, so I'll leave it there for now. It's just a bit of an introduction for you. So we'll um, get on to the presentation proper. So we were interested to look at what literature was there, if any, about young people, uh, music making and crisis. And perhaps inevitably, what we found out was that a lot of the literature on crisis and young people, such as it is, is looking at migrants, refugees, and people fleeing places which are wrought with war, uh, persecution. Uh, there's a little bit of literature um, on ecological disasters, uh, particularly in North America, and how young people have used music making or have had it offered to them as a form of self and collective therapy, which is quite an interesting body of work. Um, but but the COVID situation, as, uh, as uh, the previous presentation said, it, it was unprecedented. It took everybody by surprise. And so in a kind of developed world, for want of a better uh, term, it, it was a, a kind of 
new phenomena, at least within the last 75 years. Uh, and you know, what happened in the, in the 20th century is beyond the living memory of, of a lot of people living today in, in the developed world. So uh, the other thing we found was that um, studies look at things such as personal crisis and psychological crisis, people who are kind of at, at risk from things like mental health and what have you, and so how structured forms of intervention, including music therapy, have um, endeavoured to try and help these people improve their qualities of life. Uh, but the COVID pandemic presents um, for want of a better term, again, a, a novel opportunity to look at how a new situation is impacting young people, young music makers. So, next slide, please, Anesta. Hi, hi, everyone. Um, so, just very briefly, would like to define what we mean by well-being in our study. As you might be aware, that well-being is a very nuanced and multifaceted concept which stems from multiple aspects of life and therefore is very difficult to define and not surprisingly to date there's no agreed upon definition of well-being and it varies quite a bit depending on the field um, that research is working in so quite varied by discipline but for the purpose of our study we draw a definition of well-being as proposed by Dodge and colleagues um, that states what well-being is as Define well-being as a balance point between individual resource pool um, on psychological, social, and physical level, and the respective challenges faced. So, the figure here that you can see on the screen is a visual representation of this definition. So, as you can see from this image, um, this definition is quite dynamic, where the seesaw represents a balancing of resources and challenges, resulting in stable well-being. So in other words, in, an individual who possesses the psychological, social and physical resources um, to meet the respective challenges is considered to be in a stable state of well-being. So in case of increased challenges without additional resources, the CISO dips along with well-being and vice versa. So this definition presents a number of strengths. It is simple. Um, it can be universal in application, meaning that it can be applied to various individuals, populations, regardless of age, sex, culture, and it, there's optimism to it, meaning that individuals are able to affect their own well-being and balance that seesaw. So it is a useful definition when considering the role of music making as a supportive resource for well-being, which is what we're interested in in our current study. And we also situate the individual within the context of a global pandemic, uh, which, as we know, has created um, a lot of additional challenges that we've seen in the previous presentation as well. So in short, we apply this definition of well-being to explore how young um, music makers draw on music making as an additional resource to balance the well-being during these unprecedented, um, unusual times. So very briefly about the method, um, we conducted 18 semi-structured interviews. Uh, all of the interviews were conducted online due to restrictions, um, which worked quite well. And we recruited participants uh, based on progressive sampling, uh, where we focused on certain characteristics of um, participants, so namely the age between 18 to 35 years, so this is the age group that we're interested in. And we focused on music makers of any type and at any level, so be it professional, semi-professional and amateur. And thematic analysis was used to analyze the data. Um, I will not go into great detail here due to time restrictions, but on this slide you can see our participant characteristics. Um, so one of the things to note from, from this very busy slide um, is that we did have quite a diverse sample in terms of um, gender, in terms of music making type, um, 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 employment, uh, music making level and other characteristics. Leading into our findings, uh, one of the things to note here at the bottom, uh, we specifically focused on understanding how music making is shaping well-being of our participants. And as you can see here from these numbers at the bottom um, right, that all participants unanimously identified music making as a source of well-being, and that also was a source um, as a tool to keep them socially connected. All right, so I will hand it over to Ben to talk about preliminary findings. Thanks, Ernesta, and hi, everyone. Um, 
please let me know if um, there's any audio issue. Uh, so I guess Catherine and Fabiano have talked about how COVID-19 affected musicians um, and in large part this was a loss of income and jobs. So we were looking at a range of people, those who made income from music, whether they had international tours booked or album releases, through to those who had entirely different sources of income and of course those were in flux too. Um, and alongside and often connected with this was the mental health impacts. Um, so an example of this being combined is this quote here, Emma, who is one of uh, several people we spoke to who spoke about uh, having a year's worth of bookings for performances and therefore income cancelled over one weekend. Um, and that taken a huge toll on mental health, both because of the financial stress and the identity of this is what I do, this is who I am. And um, so for not all, but for a number of the people we spoke to, uh, the COVID situation and the lockdown brought mental health challenges. Um, for some, it was their first experience of this. Uh, for some, it was a matter of having existing uh, struggles with well-being, and this sort of tipped that balance for a couple of people and really created issues for them because they were already at capacity in terms of trying to manage their well-being. So that seesaw um, metaphor really works for what was going on here. Um, turning to our next point, we're looking at how did it affect people's music making generally? Obviously, the main point is that music making went from being, for most people, a public and social activity and often a live thing to a domestic and private activity. And that was a major change for most of the people we spoke to. Uh, some people found they had more time than ever to work on music and they took up projects, they learned new instruments, they learned new software. Some people had less time because of caring obligations or work obligations. But much like uh, the previous paper said, even among those who did have more time, there was this issue of motivation. Uh, some people said that they um, had expected to get all of these things done during lockdown and they just couldn't motivate themselves. And partly that was the lack of something to work towards, whether it be a gig or a release or someone to share their music with. Um, and people who said that they realised music making was something good for their well-being even struggled to get to it. So Kelly here summarises this. I've tried to turn to music making. She was speaking about as a strategy for mental health here, and it hasn't been as successful. But when I can get in the right mind space, it's really rewarding. So there's this idea of music making as a resource for well-being, among other things, but not like a light switch you can turn on and off, and not just a job. Um, so I guess that leads into our next point about what is it that music making offers as a resource for well-being? Because as Ernesta said, 100% of the people we spoke to said that both before and during COVID, music making is a resource for well-being and for social connection. And they think of it explicitly in those terms. And for most people, that increased during COVID. So what it offers firstly is this sense of identity. It's not just what I do, it's who I am. And there's a sense of purpose in terms of long-term projects, achievements, but also um, this idea of having an important role, almost a social or community service. There was some pride among musicians we spoke to that people need music in these times. And that was often allied with these political um, claims, like we deserve to be supported more. Um, music making was a major source of social connection for everyone we spoke to. For many people, it was what their social lives revolve around, whether that be live performance or collaborations or simply their friendship groups. During COVID, that was majorly disrupted, but um, everyone tried different ways to get around that, whether that be using online methods or simply maintaining contact with musicians or friends and having music as something to talk about sharing songs. In fact, some people began to share things with friends in a greater sense than what they had before. Music making became a collaborative thing, though distant. Um, the next point, it's a focus and a routine, so much like exercise. People spoke about every day I have to get sleep, eat well, um, 
go for a walk and I need to make some music. And that's I know that that's a thing I need for my well-being. Um, zooming into, uh, in a more internal sense, what it's like to make music, a big theme was working with feelings uh, and another big theme was communication and expression. So we do have a couple of quotes here that, uh, that sort of illustrate that point. Um, in terms of communication and expression, um, this was something that a few people said. Aria, uh, a young person at 20, said that when she was younger, she wasn't very good at expressing herself and music making was a way to express herself. And this was a common theme. And she says, as I've gotten older, uh, it's still the same thing, but as well as an external outward expression, it's a way for me to see what's going on in my own head. It's a way to monitor my inner environment. So a lot of the music makers we spoke to um, reflexively saw music making as almost like a practice of mindfulness. Um, whether you're writing a song or playing a song, it's a way to, to work with feelings in a sort of reflexive way. Um, and they saw the benefits of doing that, even by themselves at home. Um, and the, uh, the next point deals further with uh, working with feelings. Just giving an example of how some people would speak about writing or playing hopeful or positive music because they thought they needed that or because they thought the world needed that. But they also spoke about um, working with negative feelings and getting those out there and sharing those and engaging with those. And the idea of music is catharsis. As Emma says here, crying on the first line of a song, and that's a good thing. So this is something that music making offered them. And again, you see this reflexive awareness of music making as a resource, as something you use deliberately for your well-being. Um, now, the next point, okay, is looking at how people dealt with the challenges of doing this during COVID. Um, so the online environment was obviously a big thing. Um, and as Catherine said, um, there was this recognition among the more professionally minded musicians that this is something that I've always known I should work on. I'm going to use this period to do this. I'm going to do online engagement. I'm going to build my profile. I'm going to look at all the parts of a music business other than just making music. And there were varying results and they all thought I should be doing this. They didn't all love it. Um, but in terms of playing and sharing music, because there's, there was this need of, I've got to have something to work towards, even if it's a, an online performance. Um, across the board, people said, it's okay, but it's just not the same. Some bands actually said, it's not worth our while rehearsing for that or spending the money setting that up. We can't do the performance we want to do. Um, others just said it's not as emotionally satisfying. So there was some recognition that online performance is okay, but everyone said it's just not the same. Um, however, the other side of the online environment, and this is the next quote, is um, as, a, um, as a community of musicians. And in the online environment, especially on social media, um, we kept hearing this idea that musicians were speaking with each other more, feeling more of a, a collective identity and feeling this idea of a level playing field and this idea that we're all in this together. And uh, through various forms of social media, musicians were engaging with each other at different levels of professionalism and success. And they were sharing ideas, discussing how they were using music either for well-being or how they were trying to maintain careers at this time. And so there was this DIY sense of um, uh, knowledge sharing and uh, skills sharing that uh, seemed, uh, it was reported by our respondents, seemed to be a new thing. Um, so turning to the next point, Yeah, the looking at perspective, looking at, we also asked people about how they saw the future and there was more of a balance in our responses between those who uh, saw it in positive terms or negative terms, how COVID had affected things. 
Um, but there was certainly, above all, a sense of uncertainty and a loss of control. Some people said, I knew I was signing up for that when I became a musician. Some people said, I thought I was bulletproof and this has really put a hole in that for me. Um, for many people, there was a recognition of or a reminder of why they did music. So as well as it being a job and a career or a social hobby, there was this recognition of their personal connection with music. And so even for those who, as, as discussed in the last paper, we had people who said, I'm not going to be a full-time musician anymore. I don't expect I will. I've gone and got a normal job, as this quote says here at the bottom, but I am going to keep making music when I can. And I know that that's important to me. And I think some of the points we've discussed here help us to see why people would see it that way. Uh, so I think at this point I'll hand back to Andy for some summing up and reflections. Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, so what we can see is that in uh, some level, not in all cases as, as the data illustrates, but music making has been a, a form of support for young uh, people. Um, obviously, as you heard from the data, we're not although it is an important aspect of it, we're not just talking about professionalism and, 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 and income, we're talking about actual support in a kind of more psychological, mental health sort of way as well, how young people's creative impulses are kind of satisfied through music making. Um, and we can also see that the pandemic crisis has influenced young people to reflect in different ways on the value of creativity in their lives. I mean, it, it, it's something which has struck me again doing this presentation that um, the, the capacity for young people to become involved in music making has increased quite a bit uh, in the in the 40 odd years that I've been a, a, a musician. When, when I was so 16, 17, um, playing in a band, uh, less people were making music than are making music now because there weren't the resources around. Uh, you know, people weren't kind of pouring over tablature trying to find out how to play a Jimmy Page solo from Led Zeppelin 2, whereas now YouTube and various other uh, resources make those things easier as does the quality of musical instruments and, and digital recording and what have you. And again, those people aren't accessible to everybody, but they're accessible to more people than was the case when I was 16, 17. I'm talking about the technology that was available then. There's more of it now, more people access it. And so this um, feeds into the next point that young people have proactively used music making as an enabling resource during COVID-19 in, in a do-it-yourself fashion. Uh, not everyone has been able to do that. Some people felt just disillusioned and dis deflated by, by the pandemic. Um, and associated challenges were found in our data pointing to areas where youth could be supported. So what we're starting to think about is how you can take some of these ideas that came out of the data and use it to sort of create forums, and we're using that term loosely, to, to get young people together to talk about their experiences of COVID and using music uh, in more or less successful ways. Just trying to get people to talk about it in, in, in kind of semi-structured environment, maybe through a series of workshops, um, and also maybe getting people to actually write some songs about the pandemic where they can kind of collectively collaborate on, on songwriting projects, which will be, I think, particularly useful for those young people who said that they found it difficult to connect during uh, the COVID crisis. So um, I'll leave it there. Thanks for listening. <laughs> I guess um, 
Yeah, I'm just wondering if we want to field some questions. Daniel. So uh, uh, my question is actually to both teams. I'm just wondering whether there was anything in the data about how COVID may or may not have enhanced um, sort of a sense of globalisation by online collaborations. Uh, nobody in our in our um, nobody spoke about international collaborations okay. at all. In well, ours, it was it was very much about sort of local. Um, yeah, having to look sort of more inwards for us. Yeah, Ben? Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I can speak to that. I guess this goes to the point of um, a sense of solidarity and cooperation among musicians. Some people spoke about um, reaching out, including to international collaborators, in a way that they hadn't uh, felt confident to do before. And so some of the people that I spoke to have um, done that and had positive responses or they've had people reaching out to them. So there did seem to be this sense that did, that did stretch globally of, um, yeah, because you have to do something. And so maybe this was some of the more established and sophisticated musicians, but they definitely did some more of that than they would otherwise have done in terms of international online collaborations. Yeah, yeah, cool. Thanks. Bonnie? Thanks, everyone. That was really interesting. Um, I was just wondering, um, you talked about, I think the, the second presentation spoke a bit about um, COVID being an equaliser in some ways, um, but I'm wondering if there was evidence of um, inequality as well in the way that if people spoke about the way that COVID may have enhanced existing inequalities um, or perhaps created new ones. Is that something that came up at all? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I guess one, one thing I can say is that there, it was quite a diverse group of participants. Everyone I spoke to had learnt an instrument as a child, um, and but they were all applying that in different ways now, whether it be uh, a woman that I spoke to in, in public housing in Sydney with an acoustic guitar, saving up to, to go and do a recording, or people who had gone out and bought a recording suite for COVID. There were different, but pe people um, generally seemed from their perspective to be just focusing on using what they had. I guess the where the inequality came up was some people did have this time stretching out, not necessarily seen by them as a good thing in terms of their well-being, but some people did have this time opening up and some people had less time than ever because of care because of space being cooped up with people or because of work obligations. So there were those inequalities, but in terms of how they used music as a resource, there just seemed to be this sense of, I'm gonna use what I have, I'm gonna put as much resource as I can into being able to do this thing and whatever level that happened to be at. Mm. Um, we actually started out looking for inequality like it would, uh, if you notice that the office for women was one of the groups that put the money up for this project um we wanted to know if there was like a big impact in terms of gender uh and we didn't actually find that in in the results that we got um which we're sort of putting down to just the the uh the intensity of the impact that that, that it just sort of knocked everybody down together at once, um, there were some some things that came out in terms of uh, people with functional impairments, um, women, and uh, people from minority ethnicity backgrounds being more disadvantaged in some of the responses that we got. But I wouldn't say that it was like a strong systematic thing across uh, the, all of the survey results. Um, but I still think that this is a really like I'm glad that you brought this up because it's still a really important thing for us to think about. We have evidence from other. Um, crises like the global financial crisis, for instance, showed that the creative industries retreated back into its upper class white male uh, sort of strongholds um, uh, at that point in time. And I think there is there is a genuine risk, like a really strong risk that we're going to see the same sort of patterns um, over as things start to open up. I mean, I think as things start to open up is probably going to be where we're going to see more of this sort of thing playing out. Um, 
so I think it's really important um, for, uh, this is one of the recommendations in our report certainly, is that continuing to monitor, what, monitor what's happening from this point forward is going to be really important just to make sure that all of those gains that we've made over the last sort of decade or whatever in terms of inclusivity don't just completely disappear and nobody even notices it happening because I think I really think it's a genuine risk. Yeah. If Mark, you have a question. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I very much enjoyed that. Thanks everybody. Uh, this is a slightly different thing. Did, did anybody, any of the participants talk about the impact on their own creativity? Because if you are like inside and locked down and you're looking at the same four walls, where does your inspiration come from? How, how did they start to write songs if they're songwriters? I mean, did any of them talk about that? Because I, I, I myself have struggled a bit with that kind of stuff uh, as an amateur musician in the last 12 months. Um, well, I, I can speak to that. Yes, the, the concept of inspiration did did come up um, and that was an issue. But I, I think it seemed that the more important thing was I guess what I call motivation or something to work towards. So having an audience to play for. So the people who did manage to find an online network of musicians or just friends or who did, you know, find a way to engage with audiences, they were the ones who then ended up making things. Um, whereas the ones that had to sort of self-motivate, they were the ones who struggled uh, to, to, to be inspired, it seemed. But, you know, there were people... People told me that they wrote things just for themselves. Like someone said, oh, I wrote I wrote a song that basically said COVID is shit. And that'll never see the light of day, but it was important for me to do that. Uh, we, we didn't ask anything about creativity directly. Um, I would say that the, the, the answers that we got about people um, having the time to try new musical processes and production techniques um, there was there was some stuff that came out of that that was just about uh, you know feeling as though they were gaining new skills, improving as musicians, um, and that that uh, I mean we'll probably have to go back and look at it again, thinking about it in terms of creativity. But I think that was inspiration of some people that they were able to do things they weren't able to do before in terms of their own practice, um, and yeah, what what that might lead to. I'll just add, actually, I, I would add there was a bit more, a couple of people spoke about turning inward a little bit more and maybe being a bit more honest and direct um, in in what they created. That was a theme that came out, actually. Yeah, I just wanted to add um, from our project. Um, so there did seem to be, um, again, those sort of people who would say things like, oh, I felt me have time to get started on that drone project. <laughs> I've just never had time or had to make money, but now there's no money to make, so I might as well. I found that was kind of the trade off that people felt they could engage in things that they were perhaps a bit more passionate about or weren't involved with for those reasons. But they accepted as a kind of premise that it was not monetizable. And so started to devalue their own sense of creativity through that. But I'm um, still, but those people who mentioned those sort of passion projects emerging, they did seem to be more the exception rather than the rule. I suppose just to bookend that question, Mark, um, it, it, it's kind of like all of these kind of social, micro-social impacts of COVID, they will really be the last things that get kind of looked at, you know, I mean, every government in the world, you know, they just want to go back to the normal, which is kind of overpriced and un ergonomic flights, you know, uh, you know, crap map jobs and all of that kind of thing. That's all they're interested in, you know, and they're floating 10 million vaccines, all of which are going to save the world and blah, 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 and all of that. So these smaller things, you know, the people whose lives were ruined, the people who ended up sleeping in a van and all of these things, it will take years for that to sort of come out i guess and i guess along with that the covid stories through song you know they will sort of start to sort of emerge i guess you know from you know within the next year and, and so it will go so i guess how it has inspired people is still a bit of a mystery which is one of the reasons why we'd like to try and do the songwriting sort of clinics you know whatever we're going to call them but that's a basic idea on the table anyway yeah, Arnold there with his hand up. 
I think you're muted, sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm an Icelandic uh, social musicologist. I just wanted to thank you for this input and good to see you guys. Um, I'm thinking about the, the, the positive or the benefits of this situation, uh, like COVID is making this possible. You know, we, I, I wouldn't have met. I'm seeing Mark Percival here for, I haven't seen him for years. And I find it a bit just interesting to think about this double-edged sword that, you know, I find that here in Iceland, we did a similar report here in Iceland and had very similar findings. Um, for me, it seems like, an, I just wanted a viewpoint on that, that we're almost in the midst of getting used to doing uh, streamed concerts and so on, while at the same time, we're really waiting for this thing to end. Um, so it's, it, it's a bit funny for me, you know, what do you think about that? Because more technology and, and I don't know, more resilience is, is, is coming forth, but at the same time, you know, we're also waiting for it just to end and will we lose some kind of a knowledge or lose some kind of uh, knowledge to do hybrid things, you know. I, I guess uh, one thing I thought of uh, watching the first paper was when there was discussion of um, COVID being a, an opportunity to question the way things were done. Mm. Um, that, that was a theme that came up in my research. I guess on one hand, some people saw this as uh, accelerating or bringing forward change that was already happening, like digitalization. Um, uh, a musician I spoke to whose day job is in events production, he's a, he's a technician for events, um, said, yeah, we're going to be seeing weddings, funerals, performances online, and that was coming. This has brought it forward. But there's also been people who have rethought the way they do things in terms of hey, we can play at different types of venues. Do we need to play at bars? Can we look at different things? Um, so it does seem to have brought on some, some questioning, um, I guess, just by virtue of being such a, such a major existential thing, you sort of question everything, I guess. I think maybe we have time for one more. I'll, I'll take one just to just to um, you know throw it out. Um, but one thing I've really noticed in New Zealand just over the last couple of months is that there's a real sense that this is a great opportunity for the domestic market, um, and that local bands are playing a lot more shows. Um, crews are getting a lot more work because venues are just so desperate to put on shows. Um, we're also like super luckily about to enter into festival season in New Zealand. Um, and that's by virtue of many, many things we've been very lucky with. Um, but I'm just wondering if there's a similar kind of sense in Australia that, especially you mentioned, Andy, that young people are seeing a lot more positives here and a lot more opportunities, if there's a sense that there is an opportunity here for the domestic market. Um, well, I think probably Ben could speak to that because he's been on a roll with this. But I didn't get the kind of idea that that was a particularly strong view did you ben, from the from the data no no there was um yeah g generally i i think among the musicians that we spoke to compared to and this is um scientific but compared to the people that i generally meet in everyday life i feel like there was a greater awareness that this is actually going to take a long time and um going to be pretty serious for a while and things won't be the same again. So there seems to be a greater recognition of that than there is among the general public. Mm. Yeah, we, had a, we got a similar sort of thing, just the, the overwhelming sense of uncertainty, um, that just that people, uh, they weren't thinking about it, we're gonna build up the local thing because they were just like, can we even do that? And I think what we've seen over the last couple of months with what's happened in Brisbane, what's happened in Sydney, um has shown that until like the approach that australia has taken means that um even even making plans to to tour within your own state could be disrupted overnight so i think that people are still finding it very difficult to work out what to do with that um although i know that there is a lot of talk within the, the sort of policy makers and the advocates in victoria about this concept of like hyper localism like you know everything happens within 10 kilometers of your home or whatever um and maybe trying to get that to work a bit more um yeah I, I think it's still very much a work in process in progress what, 
that's going to happen. And I think just to add to what Ben was saying, I think when we're collecting data, we it, it happened during the first wave. So it was relatively early and I think things and views might have evolved and say if we're collecting data now, people might have a bit more insights about this domestic market and seeing where to from here. Um, so that could have had impact on our findings. I, I can talk to that a little bit too. Um, as, as an Adelaidean, the festival state, then we're coming into the festival season and we of course have our annual World of Music Festival and other festivals coming up. Uh, what's happening here is that, yeah, it's all local musicians that are being, and local acts that are being um, employed for these festivals rather than getting people in from all over the world and from interstate. And the, the actual talk, the, the, the vibe on the street is that that's really exciting, that we're actually boosting the local, local industry. Um, so, yeah, people, the, the, the public are pretty keen on it. So, yeah, that's, that's my perspective from an insider here in Adelaide. I, I suppose one one counterpoint um, that I did hear is that um, people, in terms of the, you know, this was late last year, so people were watching the 2021 calendar fill up, and um, they were some people were complaining, oh, that's all the the bigger sort of interstate touring acts, and because they're all lined up. Um, it's, there will be less room for the for the local and the small. However, that was sort of first wave, and now now I wonder if that's different again. Now that those bigger things really aren't actually happening, so yeah, it's probably changed. Mm. I I did have one more question that I want. Wonder if anyone in the room, not just the people that presented today, can respond to, and that's does, does anyone know what's happened to the music music instrument retail industry in the last twelve months? The uh, the anecdotal evidence, including from people I spoke to, is that um, much like Bunnings and the the hardware <laughs> and Bunnings shops, um, they got they they did a roaring trade. Um, they sold out of everything basically. That's yeah. what I heard. Quite a few of our grads are Sorry. working at um, Synstrom doing the deluges and they said they've just been absolutely run off their feet with orders and they've all like massively upskilled their soldering skills. So happy to hear that. Sorry, Tom, I interrupted you. No, it's perfectly all right. Like like you, I have some undergraduates who are who work in the UK in music and it's and it's absolutely a roaring trade. What is also interesting though is that um, the electric guitar, which is pronounced dead every five or six years, is apparently sprung back to life again, which is always, which is uh, good news for some of us, less good news for others, perhaps. <laughs> Might we wrap it there as we come to what I'm sure is rapidly approaching quite, quite late at night in certain parts of the world. Awesome. Cool. Um, yeah, just on behalf of the ANZ branch, thank you so much for everybody for coming along and a huge thank you to Rupert for organising as well. Um, it's really lovely to see so many faces. Um, and yeah, just on behalf of Australia, Aotearoa, New Zealand, massive araha to everybody across the world. I know everybody's facing extremely different situations at the moment. Um, and, you know, we're all, hearts go out to you in a big way. I'll hand back to Rupert. Well, thanks a lot, everybody, for, uh, for, for turning up. And thanks, Australia. New Zealand branch for a, a brilliantly organised and a, a fascinating insight into what's been going on over there and into the pandemic in general. Um, we look forward to the the, um, the next presentation in February. There'll be details coming out soon uh, what that'll be on and where it is. Um, and these will keep happening every every month. And I hope this is now going to be a, a permanent thing in our calendar that won't, won't just happen in um, in coronavirus times, but will be a, a long-term form of communication for ISP. Um, and it, it's great to see everyone, and I look forward to seeing you again next month. Thanks a lot again to everyone, all the presenters, uh, for such fascinating work. Thank you. Thanks, guys. See you all. Bye-bye. Thanks, Rupert. Thanks, Rupert. Thanks, Rupert. Thanks, Rupert. Thanks, Rupert.